You can turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 9. The question comes up, why does God let heretics live? <laughs> oh, man. We're seeing them nowadays, aren't we? Uh, in abundance. Romans chapter 9, verse 13 through 24. Make some interesting observations here today. Let's start out here. Romans 9, verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Uh, don't ever fall for this lie that God does not hate people. There are certain people that earn God's hatred. And you study what Esau was. Uh, Esau denied his birthright for food. <laughs> Didn't even care about something that, that his father promised him. You know, and, and just kind of, yeah, whatever, you can have birthright. I, I don't care. You know, um, interracially married on purpose to tick his parents off, not once, but twice, you know, and it's going to kill his brother. And I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of other things that he did. He was wicked and God hated him. It, didn't, it doesn't say God hated his sin. God hated what he became. God, God hated, uh, the, the group that he ran with. God hated him. <laughs> Esau have I hated. Uh, yeah, there are people that God hates. Keep that in mind as we continue. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. You know, one of the big arguments that atheists will come up with, they'll say, I just can't believe in a God that would send somebody to hell and burn them forever. I just can't believe in a God. What right do you have to say anything about God? Who are you to judge God? <laughs> we'll see that here as we continue. Verse 15, there is no unrighteousness with God, by the way. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Even the most evil, wicked people, God still controls them. Hmm. You say, well, I, I just don't understand. Oh, God controls everybody. God controls everything. You know? A lot of people have these funny notions that God's just some kind of a big sissy teddy bear up in heaven that just kind of bites his fingernails when he sees how bad things are getting. Um, people have a free will, and the Calvinists will mess this whole thing up trying to get rid of free will and, and things and proving that God basically created robots. The elect robots and the non-elect robots. You know, electrified and non-electrified, I guess. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, <laughs> um, that's not the truth. People have free will. Pharaoh had a free will up until a certain point, and he hardened his heart. He said, no, I'm not interested. Everybody has that free will. That's why other places in Scripture, all throughout Scripture, you know, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent, not all men of the elect to repent. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, not whosoever of the elect. <laughs> But if you're a Calvinist, you've got to put of the elect in each of those passages. Um, if you're a Bible believer, you look and you say, well, God is commanding all men to repent. God provides salvation for all men. His grace appears to all men. So how could there be non-elect and elect in the sense of they have no choice in their salvation? It doesn't work. What it's talking about is there are some people that God gives them a free will and they get to a certain point where they cross the line with the Lord and the Lord says, okay, I'm going to use you for my purposes. And you're going to be an evil little devil that's out there persecuting Christians. And there's reasons why God allows this. And it's hard to go through. But I'll tell you right now, God has a purpose. God is in control. Verse 18. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. There are certain things that you can do before the Lord, and uh, He'll harden you pretty quickly. Um, you start messing around with little children like these Catholic priests, their hearts are hardened quickly. Um, there aren't too many pedophiles that get saved and truly born again. You get into that kind of thing, yeah. you get into sodomy, um, depending on the situation, uh, there are some sodomites that just got in there because of the culture messed them up and they were maybe molested as a child or or whatever else, and they're just confused and, and things, and they're, and okay, fine. I think God will have some grace. But you get some of these sodomites that are radical, God-hating, atheistic, uh, just 
hate the Bible and, and whatever. Uh, pretty dangerous. And you get to that point of where you've blasphemed God one too many times and the Lord just says, okay, I'm going to now use you for my purposes. And you know one of the reasons why a lot of people out there in this world right now, why it's just you can't get through to them, they're just, you can't witness to them and whatever else? Um, because a lot of these people are statistics. They're going to end up as statistics in the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm going to tell you that right now. You and I, when we walk around in public, you and I am talking about Bible-believing Christians. When we walk around in public and you see these people that are just, just zombies, <laughs> essentially, you are literally looking into the eyeballs of people that are going to be the statistics of Revelation. A third of the people die. These people take the mark and they get this grievous sore upon them and whatever else, and they're blaspheming God. You're looking into the eyeballs of those people. Yeah. Weird to think about. But let's continue. Verse 19, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nobody has resisted his will in the sense of uh, he forces them into a certain way of thinking or whatever else. Verse 20, Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? God's in control. And you don't have a right to just, you know, as a, as a little feeble mortal man or woman or whatever, to be down here and just angrily shouting at God and whatever else. You don't have a right to do that. What you need to do if you have any intelligence at all, is you need to read this book. And you need to see that this book condemns your sin. And you need to understand that that sin is negative. There are no sins condemned in this book that are good for you. Okay? Not one. Uh, if you're smart, you'll say, you know what? I need help with this life of sin that I have. I, I don't want to live like this anymore. I want out of this life. If you're a sodomite, um, that is a life that is self-destructive. Literally, you are self-sterilizing. You'll never have children. And you'll, you're told, yet you're told by evolutionary modern philosophies that uh, you, you are the way you are because of genetic traits. Think about that. It's not even possible. Genetic traits that produce two homosexuals, um, they can't breed. The genetic trait dies in one generation. How does a genetic trait of homosexuality get passed down from generation to generation to generation if they can't breed and reproduce? It doesn't work. I mean, if some guy's born with a weird genetic trait and he's got, uh, his eyes are, are purple or something, um, and he never marries, well, guess what? That genetic trait died with him. Well, same thing with sodomy, with the homosexual thing. See, God says it's a sin. God condemns it in Scripture because it's negative. It's hurtful. You'll never experience the joy of actually seeing your own child, your own flesh and blood, and the loving relationship between a husband and a wife that produces that child. And you look at the child and you say, boy, he sure has mom's nose. He's got dad's eyes, but he's got mom's nose. You'll never know that. You'll never know that. All sin is negative. Let God help you with that life of sin that you're living. Come to Him as a sinner. Don't try to fix yourself up. Let Him fix you up. But let's continue. Now here's the key. The next two verses, 22 and 23, are the keys to this thing of why doesn't God just kill the wicked? Wicked heretics out there. What if God, willing to show His wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto his un, excuse me unto glory. Hmm. You see, that's the key to this whole thing. And uh, this is something I've struggled with over the years, very much, because I see some people and they're just totally wicked, and I've seen sometimes. Uh, I mean, I've rebuked people to their faces, and there was a pastor years ago, 
um, ironically named Brian, at uh, Cornerstone Baptist Church that I used to go to, and I cornered him on the Bible version issue. And within a month, the guy's life fell apart. Did it to another guy, uh, another older man, and got into the Bible version issue thing. And I said, does King James Bible, does it perfect? He said, he said, no, it's not. I said, okay, then what is the perfect Bible? He said, no such book exists. Within 24 hours, his wife handed him divorce papers, and his life fell apart. Health fell apart. I've seen God's judgment come in very quickly and hit people hard, and yet I've seen others that are just wicked. They attack me. They try to destroy my ministry. They attack other Christians. They're wicked. I just You can't get through to them. There's, there's, no, there's no desire on their part to get saved, genuinely saved, to be born again. And, and I pray, and I say, Lord, please stop them. And he doesn't. And you think, what on earth is going on, Lord? I don't, I don't get it. Why, why this person over here, but this one, no. What's going on there? God is willing to show his, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known. Two things there. He's going to show his wrath on that person. He'll let them get away with some things, but he's got their end planned. Another place in Scripture, Paul's talking and saying about people lying about him, and he says, whose damnation is just. Yeah, they're earning their damnation. But God is going to time it out, and he's going to use them for his purposes. And we'll see what part of that is. To make his power known. You say, wait a second. Wicked lost people can make God's power known? How does that make any sense? Endured with much long suffering the vessels of vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Okay? These are vessels of wrath. They cross the line with the Lord by an act of their own free will. And God says, Okay, I'm going to harden your heart, and now I'm going to use you for my purposes, to make my power known. Not through you. They are vessels of vessel of wrath. Verse 23, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared. Unto glory. That's the issue. You see, I have seen this thing for years and years that some of my worst enemies that try to destroy me, they try to attack me, they try to do all kinds of things to King James Video Ministries and to me personally, and yet it all fizzles out. Why? Because God's power is upon this ministry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it still blows my mind that God has used me as much as He has over the years. And yet here I am. And there's been some very, very hard attacks on us. Very harsh attacks. Extremely. <laughs> and I'm still here. Why? Um, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. I can't take any credit for being here. I can't tell you that I'm strong. I'm, I'm so strong. These people don't ever get under my skin. Oh, they get under my skin. Um... These people don't ever tick me off, you know, and, and make me want to quit and whatever. Oh, no, no, they, they do. They do. Yeah. But I'm still here. Why? Because I bring glory to Jesus Christ and to his word. I magnify this book. I put it in the proper position it's supposed to be in. That's why. Um, I can't tell you that I'm, I'm here today. I'm continuing to preach the word because of my education, my PhD and THD and THM and my honorary doctorates that I've earned over the... I don't have any of that stuff. None of it. I don't want it. <laughs> but uh, there's nothing I can glory in. I'm just a, a ignorant old hillbilly and, and God used me. Okay. You know, I, I, I'm not saying that this is what I'd be, but I can, I can understand these 24 elders. You know, they get up there to heaven and, and you know, they got crowns. Beautiful crowns. It's not just some cheap little... Burger King, you know, crown on their head or something. And they're beautiful crowns. Lord made it for them. Lord crowned them. Put it on their head. Lord's up there on his throne. And what do they do? Take that crown off and throw it up before the throne. Fall down before the Lord. I can understand that. After being in ministry all these years. Yeah, I can understand that. Uh, I don't know why the Lord's put up with me this whole time. I really don't. <laughs> I mean, some of the stupid things I've done and said and thought and whatever. Um, he's put up with me. I don't take any glory. I don't take any credit. 
I can't wait for heaven. Just to give Him glory for all that He's done. But uh, why does the Lord put up with these people? Um, to show who He has chosen. Who uh, His hand of approval is on, in other words. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me show you that. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 through 19. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Are there any divisions in the church today? <laughs> yes, <laughs> there's a lot of divisions. Uh, it's terrible. I mean, you know, back even when I first got on YouTube, 2008, you know, I'm not even talking, you know, back in the good old days, back in the 1980s when I was a boy, you know, uh, no, I'm talking 10 years ago. Things were a lot more civil. Okay, people were a lot more respectful with one another. I mean, I've, you go back and watch my oldest stuff, I've always been very sarcastic and, you know, uh, not politically correct in my preaching. Um, but it's, it's, it's based on love. I don't think a lot of people get that. I, I have, you know, no time for the enemies of the gospel, okay, that, that, that know the truth and yet try to twist it and try to turn people away and turn them into hell. I don't have any time for those people and I'm going to call them out and I'm going to name them, name names and whatever else. But uh, when I'm sarcastic about certain systems, it's because a lot of times I've been going through that stuff myself and I'm being very blunt to turn people away from it. Okay? Sin is, is kind of like a, um, a, a hot you know, electrical plug that's glowing red that's sticking into the wall and somebody goes over to grab it and you don't, you don't just say and they, they touch it and it starts to shock them. You don't go over and say, now let me just gently, you know, give me a little, little kiss on the hand there. Does that feel good? No. You take a wooden stick and you smack their hand off that, that plug. Why? Because if you go over there and touch it, you're going to get shocked as well. Okay, that's a good analogy of sin. They're getting shocked. You can't go over there and say, let me join you in that. Let me, you know, oh, you're, you're a drunk? Uh, yeah, I'm a drunk. Okay, let me come into the bar and hang out with you. Oh, oh, I'm getting drunk now too. That's a bad idea. Oh, you like Hollywood movies? You're getting shocked by Hollywood movies? Here, let me come on and I'll just watch the movie with you. Oh, no, I'm getting shocked as well. Use it on anything with sin. No, you need to come over and you need to take a stick, wooden stick, you know, electricity does not go through wood. And you need to take that thing and just bang and hit their hand off that plug. That's what you have to do. Almost to the point of breaking their hand. Whack that hand off that plug. Get them away from that electrical current. That's what you have to do with sinners. You have to take the Word of God and you have to say, you know what? I'm going to take this book and I'm going to just smack your hand with it to get you away from sin. Why? Because you're being hurt by the sin. Shocking, isn't it? That's a joker. But uh, <laughs> let's continue. Verse 19. Here's a key. Why is God putting up with these vessels of wrath that are fitted to destruction? Much long suffering and think, why? Why does he leave them in the body of Christ? Why not just kill them? It's, oh, this guy's preaching heresy. He's leading people. What? Bam, dead. Get him out of there. Oh, there's another one. Boom, dead. Get him out. Why? For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. The Lord allows heresies to be in the body of Christ. Why? So he can show who's truly approved. You can look at the different ministers out there and you can look at men making videos and you know, male preachers and things and you can say, hey, you know what? That brother there lines up with the scriptures. Okay, I don't agree with him, you know, in, in this area or and maybe that, but those aren't major doctrines. Those are things that we can agree to disagree on. Give you a good example, Lester Roloff. Lester Roloff was a vegetarian. Now, he wasn't, you know, ultra radical. If you eat meat, you're going to hell or anything like that. But, you know, he was you know, borderline a little bit too nutty on the vegetarian thing. Um, but you know what? The Bible says that we can agree to disagree on that issue. One who's weak eats herbs. Another eats meat. Not a problem. Another one is the celebration of holidays. That's another one of the areas that we can agree to disagree on. Head coverings, another one. 
If any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither churches of God. Somebody wants to, a woman wants to wear a head covering? Okay, fine, whatever. More of a cultural thing and things. If you're saying it's your spiritual protection or whatever else and shows your headship, or eh, eh, that's kind of a problem. But if some woman wants to wear a head covering and this is kind of a cultural thing, well, no big deal. Agree to, you can agree to disagree on that. But uh, major points of doctrine? No. There's no scripture saying we can you know, join together with post-tribbers or we can join together with non-dispensational people or uh, people that don't believe in eternal security or that, you know, that, that, no, 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 no. You say, well, then God just gets rid of all those people and we never have them trying to infiltrate or trying to, to you know, whatever. They're pretending that they're one of us just to get in and spy out our liberty and all this stuff. Of course, that never happens on YouTube. I was just saying that in, yeah. <laughs> uh, why does God allow that stuff to happen? So that the true uh, preachers and things, the true teachers of the Bible, that they can be made manifest. And it isn't just me, by the way. Uh, there's a lot of other brethren that are out there that are coming out in there, and they're bringing up better points than I've even brought out. Why? Because it's the same spirit that's in us. I'm not the Holy Spirit's mouthpiece on earth for today, and only truth can come through the mouth of Brian Denlinger or something. No. There's other brethren out there, some a lot younger than me, and they bring truth out. Very, very good points that they bring out. But God leaves the heretics there, the vessels of wrath. He leaves them there. And I've seen these guys, and they'll go for years and years and years and years and years, and all of a sudden, boom, the axe falls. And God says, okay, I've used you enough. Hmm. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse 18 through 21. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, singular, in other words, the man of sin, the son of perdition, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. Um, an Antichrist is not just somebody that hates Jesus Christ. It's also somebody that pretends to be Jesus Christ. Or you could say it in the sense of many antichrists, uh, people that pretend to be Christians. Yeah. One of the most important teachings of Scripture is the thing about false brethren and perils among false brethren. Um, there are a lot of people out there that claim to be Christians, and they're not Christians. And you get around them, and at first they're kind of, you're kind of, oh, yeah, okay. And, and it's, it's weird, too, because you'll feel kind of a nervousness around certain people that profess to be Christians and you aren't going to really know why at first. And you're kind of, okay, yeah, hey, you know. And I mean, I was at the store the one time up here and I got to talking to an older man. I'd say he was probably in his late 60s and uh, he sounded like just a conservative Christian. And I shook his hand and once. I said, hey, praise the Lord, brother, you know, and, and whatever. And, and I didn't even feel right doing it. But I thought, well, so far it sounds pretty good. And... <laughs> And all of a sudden, the guy just started getting into all kinds of weird stuff. And, and I think the guy could have been a Jesuit, to be very frank with you. I mean, I think the guy was saying some really, really weird stuff. And, you know, and just odd things and whatever else. And, and uh, I don't know. It was kind of weird because we actually saw him in another store. And he followed us to, an, to the uh, store where we another story we went to and actually came up and talk, started talking to me. So weird, but uh, you'll feel that thing. You'll get around some of these people and they, they seem okay, but you just kind of feel, eh, I don't know what's going on here. It's the Holy Spirit trying to tell you something. Uh, there's many antichrists out there. That's how we know it's the last time. Yeah. But look at verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Huh. There must also be heresies among you. Why does God allow the vessels of wrath to continue to be in the body of Christ? Oh, uh, he's got them there for a reason. 
so that you can see who's real and who's not. And uh, I've talked about this many times before, but there are certain dividing lines that have come up in the last 10 years uh, that I've seen a lot of people fall away. And the Lord brings these dividing lines down. I mean, this whole Godhead versus Trinity thing. I, I was preaching the Godhead years ago, and a lot of the people that are coming out calling me a heretic now were supporting me back then when I was preaching the same exact thing. You know, I've been preaching it for years. In this very room right here, I rebuked Martin Richling standing in this exact same spot. I re rebuked Martin Richling for saying that prayer is a work, uh, for denying Jesus Christ, that he said that Jesus Christ is not God. He's a created being. Um, you know, and I rebuked him standing right here in, what, 2000 and, uh, 2014, five years ago, okay? Um, but I'm a heretic now. Uh, the, the same people that called me blessed back then now call me an enemy and, a, and false and whatever else. Why? They were not of us. Uh, they went out from us, excuse me, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Yeah. Again, my gospel hasn't changed. I've preached the exact same gospel. People used to call me a great preacher. Now they call me false. They went out from us. They used to pretend that they were a supporter of this ministry. But they went away. They're manifest. They're vessels of wrath, you see. And, you know, somebody come along and they say, Hey, brother, you know, I'm, I'm starting a vegetarian diet. I'm not going to scream, heretic, you know, you... You're going to hell or something. No, I don't care. You don't want to eat meat or whatever else. That, you know, I think it's you know, part little, little stages of time that you go and you eat more fruit and vegetables and whatever else. It's good for the body, you know, kind of cleanses things and whatever else. Uh, my grandparents, uh, different times when their garden was really doing well, um, they would eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, really wouldn't eat much meat because it was cheap. It's what their garden, garden is growing. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not going to condemn somebody. Somebody comes along and they say, hey, I don't want anything to do with Christmas. Well, okay. Somebody else comes along and they say, hey, we, we enjoy Christmas. We don't do the whole Santa Claus thing and all the other materialistic whatever, but we we like to, you know, put up some Christmas lights in a, in a tree and whatever, whatever. Some cultures are more strong than that. Other cultures are not. Some cultures do other types of holidays or customs or traditions or whatever. I'm not going to argue. Some guy comes along and says, hey, my brother, my, my wife, not my brother, <laughs> my wife, my wife uh, wants to wear some kind of a cloth thing on her head or whatever else. I said, well, as long as it's not some kind of spiritual thing that you're trying to make it into there. Uh, you're her spiritual covering, brother, not uh, that thing on her head. Whatever. Not going to argue with people. But somebody comes along and they say, uh, I don't believe that you have to pray to be saved. You don't have to call upon. Calling does not mean asking God to save you like Robert Breaker teaches. What stinking heretic. You know, uh-uh, no, sorry. Nope. Um, hey, I used to be a follower of your ministry, Denlinger, but now you've gone off. I say, okay, in what areas? Well, I'm now, I'm, I'm no longer into the whole pre-trip thing. Okay, get away from me, heretic. Uh, well, you know, I, I used to stand for the King James Bible, but now, that, get away from me. Uh, you know, I, I uh, agree with everything that you say except for the Trinity thing. Bye-bye, go away. Um, dividing lines. It's there. Why? Um, because God is making some things manifest. Let's continue reading. Verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy Three, and ye know all... Th oh, excuse me. Ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Why can't we just have that as a simple standard? I mean, when you really break down what the Bible teaches for a New Testament Christian, it is so easy. It's so easy. Salvation's not difficult. All right? The, the rules of fellowship are not difficult. They're really not difficult. You know? And I, I hear people that profess to be Christians and they say, I have friends that are post-millennial and amillennial. We all just kind of get along. We don't agree. You know, we just agree to disagree. And I think, no lie is of the truth right there. That no lie is of the truth. The spirit of truth is supposed to be there in a fellowship. 
Well, it's not there. But, you know, I, I think that we can just kind of, you know, have this leaven in here and it won't leaven the whole lump. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Hey, is post-trib true or not? The post-trib rapture system, is it true or not? Well, no, it's a lot. Then, then get the people away. Does the Bible teach the Trinity? No, it does not. You're demoting Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is now the second member of the Trinity. He's just one of three gods. See? Oh, well, yeah, okay, technically it's a lie, but I think that we, could sh we still just shouldn't keep, kick these people away from us. You see the problem? The Bible and, and fellowship and everything else, it's really not that difficult. But yet the flesh just kind of wants to say, I don't want to take the radical stands. I just want to kind of get along and go along to get along. And I don't, I don't really want to upset people. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want people casting out my name as evil and, and, and being in perils among false brethren. I, I just, I don't want the exposed videos coming out against me. And, and I, I don't want all the people just hating my guts and whatever else. You better get over that stuff. So, that's why God is letting these heretics live, brethren. Um, rebuke them. Rebuke them harshly. Um, all these different heretics out there, you can go down through the list. I'm not going to bother naming them. I'm not going to waste my time. I've named them all in the past. I'm not afraid to name them. Uh, but, but rebuke them. But understand that uh, you shouldn't get frustrated when you see them still living. Why? Because God is using them for His purposes. And I'll tell you right now, um, another prophecy of Scripture is where Paul talks about the time coming that they don't endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You know? I have a dog downstairs, and uh, she likes to have her ears scratched. You know? Makes her feel good. It's all about feelings. And you see, the people out there, they say, uh, I don't want to take a stand against this Trinity thing because I have Catholic relatives. And all brother so and so, he makes it just, it all just lines up. Boy, it's, it just makes so much sense. So I don't have to offend people more than I already have. Um, brother so and so over there, he uh, he uses the King James Bible, but uh, he also uses the Texas Receptus, and I think that that might be a better stand to take. And we can study the Greek and things like that, just in case we find some words in here that we don't particularly think should be in there. You know what I mean? Hey, uh, Pastor so-and-so over there, he said that repentance there is just turning from unbelief to belief. And you know, there's none of this, this conviction of sin and con contrition and I'm a, I'm a wicked sinner. And, and uh, you know, I mean, because, okay, we, I, technically, yes, we're all sinners. But, I mean, I, there's certain things I just, you know, I don't think you need to give up if, if you get saved and think. You see? Another one of the reasons that God is leaving a lot of these heretics out there the Stephen Andersons and people like that. And he's, in fact, growing. Stephen Anderson's movement is growing. Why? Well, because God has future plans for them. And the day is going to come when they're going to be finally feeling the full wrath of Almighty God upon them. I mean, they're going into the time of Jacob's trouble, so why wouldn't they? You know, they're prophesying their own doom. You know, there is no pre-tree rapture. You're absolutely correct for you. We're going into the time of Jacob's trouble. They say the great tribulation. We're going into the great tribulation. You're absolutely correct for you. And the people that follow you, the people that want that kind of a thing, where all they have to give up is their unbelief to be saved. Okay. Go have your ears scratched. Just wanted to encourage you out there, all of you, um, when you see these wicked people just seeming to get away with murder and you're thinking, uh, Lord, why aren't these people, you know, why aren't you shutting their mouths? God's got it all under control. And their day of judgment and wrath on them is coming. So hopefully that's an encouragement to you. Thank you to all those out there that support the ministry. And um, please do keep us in your prayers. Um, and we'll see you in the next video.